of the Lonely Office, your playbook for navigating the messy line between work and life. I had a buddy of mine I hadn't talked to in a long time. They right. just got laid off. This guy had to clear out a lot of his 401k. 10% penalty. That's well, harsh. You know what the first thing I said? Why are you asking me? I liquidated that <laughs> shit three times. I'm a disaster. I think the knowledge worker, the professional worker, particularly now, needs to be prepared possibly to go longer without a job. First off, let's say like the latest job op openings report just kind of dropped. Not too much surprise there. Layoffs rose to, you know, one and three quarter of a million jobs. U.S. job openings yeah. fell from a revised eight to, to just a little over seven and a half. The economy in many ways is resorting to the pre-pandemic kind of lull because obviously we got a bit of the uh, boom during the pandemic era. And so the point is, is like, I think the worker has to be prepared possibly for like a longer hibernation. And the reason why that's important is because, you know, a lot of us do have 401ks. A lot of us have, you know, savings that they were counting on drawing down if we're in between jobs, but we're never expecting to go after that 401k. Well, you know, it, the moment you hit that three month mark, that six month mark, that eight yeah. month mark, you might have to hit that 401k. My buddy did. So you got to be yeah. prepared. Yeah, you got to be prepared. You know, an interesting kind of chart that made the rounds online. And, you know, here, just looking at this chart, it's the number of workers at, at, at an S&P 500 company. So this yeah. is a company that's, you know, amongst the more highly valued companies in the economy. Uh, the number of workers needed to generate 1 million in revenue. It was around eight workers in 1990, and it's down to two workers today. Matt, this looks like and the biggest water slide at at, the, at one of the biggest theme parks here in Ohio called Cedar Point. It looks like a giant water slide. And even this. if you just look at from 2000, so so four workers in 2000 to generate $1 million in revenue for the company, two workers today. Wow. Okay, this is not adjusted for inflation, but even when you look at the adjusted graph, yeah. the message still stays the same. Companies can generate more revenue with fewer employees as time goes by. That's not really a big surprise, right? Because right. we know historically you've had offshoring, outsourcing, all types of productivity gains. Right. But I think reading the commentary online, it's just really telling that most of it was so focused on this trend as being positive, positive for the economy. You're extracting more out of the existing pool of professional workers and productivity is increasing and that's positive for companies' margins, Right. The thing is, and I'm surprised that we don't hear more of media talking about this, is that that story sounds very familiar. When you look at the economic narrative, particularly just the last eight years, a lot of that narrative is about the drying out of the Rust Belt and other middle-class manufacturing jobs due to the disproportionate impact of offshoring and outsourcing mm -hmm. right, on those industries and communities. And if you went back to the early 2000s, right through the early teens, a lot of the commentary then, too, was about how great that was and the incredible efficiencies in the supply chain and the productivity that were being kind of garnered due to the offshoring. Fast forward now, a lot of workers in the professional services sector have a bit of a spidey sense, the sixth sense, that AI and a lot of the efficiencies being garnered from there are starting to cause companies to recalibrate staffing levels needed to do work, the yeah. same work that they've been doing for four years. Now you need a lot less individuals. And this has not really been documented. We've talked about this. There's not a lot of you know hardcore research on this, but it's kind of this, this general sense. And now as those knowledge workers are being laid off, they're less confident than ever that they're going to be able to re-enter the professional workforce because they know all these efficiencies have been garnered and, and achieved by that industry. It sounds really familiar, right? It's just in one case, yeah. it was the manufacturing worker and in our case, the professional white collar worker. And the, the white collar worker, of course, their overall financial health is stronger and and they might be in a better position, but they're still privy to the same effects that the manufacturing worker was due to the productivity gains. And it's something not, not being talked about all that much. Well, this really hits home because you know I'm 20 minutes south of Cleveland. And so the history of the Rust Belt would you say drying up? That, right. There was a pain that's still being felt here, even though we've bounced back in a lot of ways, there's still the scars there of that industry, right? So right. workers knew that, just like the factory worker knows, and they know when something's off. They're the first ones to say, yeah, something's weird. They had a sense, that spidey sense was then, but here's what's happening. That buddy of mine, he's a remote worker. You're working at home. We hear, we right. hear the, your little kids in the background. My point is, it was the factory worker. Now it's the remote worker. So you thought, okay, well, I'm safe in the remote space. Mm, 
not really contemporaries of mine who are white collar professionals are coming to me and asking, how do I navigate getting laid off? Because I don't think I'm going to get back to work for another six months or so because of the, the job market. You know, there's another story relevant to this because we know a lot of the Rust Belt has to do with auto manufacturers. Yeah. And when Steel. you look in Europe, yeah, when you look in Europe, most people don't really know these stories. You know, so Germany's Volkswagen has had a long standing job protection pledge. It's been enforced since 1994 that that bars layoffs through 2029. And so they, they announced that they're aiming to cancel their no layoff pledge for the first time since oh, 1994. Okay. And that's a big deal. When we talk about, you know, the pressures being put on companies uh, to, to kind of milk out more productivity and then the resulting impact on workers, it's still clearly happening in the manufacturing industry. We just talked about Volkswagen here. A lot of that now is coming home to roost with the professional knowledge worker too, uh, foreseeably through AI. And so we're in a different type of economy here, right? Our capitalistic bent is a little stronger than Germany, less of the kind of the, the social policy legislation that goes on in Germany. But if in Germany, they're, they're starting to renege on those pledges, it should, could be a bit of an indicator on what's going to happen moving forward in the US as well. Well, you said th it was a nice way of saying people should prepare for hibernation. Matt, it just means you're going to be out of work. I'm not busting you up. I'm saying literally hibernation means you're not going to be well, working for a while. We don't want to fear monger, but I think it's, if you look at just recent history, you could be led to believe easily that once the interest rate cycle is put into effect and, mm -hmm. you know, the Fed comes in and cuts it, we're going to all get our jobs back. And, you know, the economy is going to go into a heating mode again. I, I don't think you can bank on that. Okay. And I think particularly with the story of your friend who had to to access his 401k, I think it, it makes it more incumbent on us to just be really honest. If there's scenarios people are accessing 401k, then maybe you need to plan for a little longer. Just because there's, again, an interest rate cut cycle is no guarantee companies are going to go loosen up their hiring again. But So on the hibernation note, you're saying from a planning standpoint, you got to stock up. I'm not saying yeah, you're up. a survivalist. Yeah. I'm saying you're Matt's stock out up. there stocking up on canned goods. But you're saying yeah. just be a little bit more proactive in that financial planning is what I'm hearing. And more conservative. Thank <laughs> you.